emphasized substance over style and made it about policies first and foremost. He was also incredibly insightful, inspirational, and knowledgeable as a former TV host. Things began to climb. At its high point, she was on 120% of America as I continued to drop this dime. The show became exceedingly popular as she was on two stations at the same time. World and his book made the New York Times bestseller list in the fall of 2007. Many would gloat, but he doesn't, as his humble approach to life and his family are the true definition of heaven. He's looking to take the lead. His progress will never impede. He's a legendary, talented human being indeed. A mother, a storyteller, but I call her friend. Her energy and personality always conjures up a smile. Knowing her is appreciating such a trend. Will she leave her opponents in this tournament catching their breath, marveling at her excellence while they rethink their plan? He's inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. But despite the name, the acclaim, and knowing the game, this man is as real as they come. He doesn't rely on shtick, even though he can rock the stick. He's built companies brick by brick. For 70 episodic television programs and 50 professional stage production, his resume is breathtaking. As Jack Arnold, his work on The Wonder Years was absolutely groundbreaking. Have these rhymes come to an end so I can bring this great man in? That was always the plan. And in the eyes of the fans, he could do no wrong. They love that catchy theme song. So welcome, a WWE Hall of Fame talent, a human being, and scream Yahoo. They know his name in Brooklyn from everywhere and every avenue to the country of Peru. Greatness is here again tonight. But despite the many double-doubles, the limitless times, he made our jaw drop as we went, whoa. A human being that is going to embark with his strength like Iron Man in class, like Tony Stark. Last name Ferrigno, first name Lou. Lou, welcome, my friend. The kind, intelligent, one and only, Mr. Teddy Long. Last name Bischoff, first name Eric. Eric, welcome, my friend. Last name Raphael, first name Sally. Sally, first name Christopher. Last name Reed, welcome to the celebrity tournament, my friend. Last name Ventura, first name Jess. <laughs> last name Franklin, first name Diane. Diane Frank, last name Smith. First name Joe, Joe Smith, welcome my friend. Last name Arnold, first name Dan. Put your hands together for a wonderful, real, sincere human being. Last name Henry, first name Mark, Mark Henry, welcome again my friend. Thank you, that's the best introduction I've ever heard in my life. You know something, you need to quit the show and be my moderator and travel with me. <laughs> oh my God, Avi. <laughs> Where did you get all of that from? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Listen, Blair, let me tell you, I've just been waiting on one of those introductions and I was sitting here watching the opening of the show. Sitting here, I'm saying to myself, please, I'm waiting on him to introduce me. I want to see exactly what they mean. And they didn't lie. Your mic skills are tremendous, Blair. I'll tell you this, Abby, you, you definitely do your homework. Your bios are just outstanding. Dan Franklin, welcome to the Celebrity Grand Debate Tournament. That is the most excellent intro I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, please. Dan Loria, Dan Loria, welcome, my friend. Oh, thanks for having me, Abby. What an intro. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, Lynn manuel Miranda must be very jealous of me. I just experienced sympathy cardio. My heart rate's about 120 beats a minute just listening to that intro, brother. Oh, I don't know how you do it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, that was thanks. awesome. <laughs> oh, my dear, my dear, my dear, what an intro. Wow. Boy, you do your homework. Whoa. You know, I didn't even know some of that. <laughs> my brother, listen, let's call Guinness and get that out of the way. Because, sir, you just broke the world record for the most rhymes with O. So, like, I told you that this show uh, should be on mainstream television because it's the only show that I've ever been a part of that I feel like is actually solving the world's problems through the fact that you have people that are experts. What's up, man? Wow. Thank you, Avi. That was...
your opening salvo is very, very, uh, very entertaining. And like I said, it gave me, uh, it gave me like a battle rap spoken word. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know if you're it's into that. I'm kind of, I'm kind of into that. But, but yeah, very, very clever word Thank play. You. So the English major in me certainly uh, appreciates oh. that. You, you give good intro. <laughs> Greatness. Storytelling forges connections among people and between people and ideas. Greatness. When greatness is packed away like yesterday's laundry, there lies a solemn reserve. And these are the improbable ingredients to human emotion. And emotions say like fear. Some fail to understand the properties of terror. Some lived in night and woke up to morning. Some took a dark spot from the tapestry of their life and rubbed it clean. Some pushed through with their colossal hearts on full display as they simply refused to be content. Greatness. More than meets the eye for sure. If success is the pursuit of progress, despite failure, success is indeed prevalent. A man that has deep understanding of human nature and the world around him so happens to be my next guest. His work of art can be seen, heard, and felt as it is timeless. Both literally and figuratively, he has taken a blank canvas and filled it up with beauty because his expressions are wholehearted and authentic. Aristotle said, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Well, the latter rings true as it epitomizes my guest wholeheartedly. The following guest, guys and gals, has given life to hundreds of nameless spirits who've all made us laugh, cry. His work epitomizes the unselfish collaboration as he has created such great harmony with fellow colleagues. He's a remarkable and fascinating human being with layers of depth going several orders of magnitude deep. And he has shared the intimate understanding of the self with us, a public audience. But before I introduce him, let's hop into the old DeLorean and set it back, guys and gals, to April of 56. The first episode of the long-running U.S. TV soap, As the World Turns, is broadcast on CBS for the very first time. Elvis Presley signs a three-picture contract with Paramount Pictures. Ampex, the predecessor of the VHS, demonstrates videotape VR-1000, the first line of two VHS tapes or the predecessors of the VHS. American actress Grace Kelly marries Rainer III, Prince of Monaco in a civil ceremony at the Prince's Palace of Monaco. World Heavyweight Champion Rocky Marciano announces his retirement, age 32, from professional boxing without having lost any one of his 49 bouts. France completes its military withdrawal from Vietnam with the last of the French force leaving the country. After leaving, guys and gals, San Francisco and leading the San Francisco Dons to two NCAA championships in 55 and 56, Bill Russell prepares for the U.S. Olympic team prior to a historic and unprecedented career as a Boston Celtic. Yours truly is 30 years away from kicking his elementary school teacher in the shin for ripping up his comic book, 40 years away from riding his first motorcycle, 50 years away from riding from a major studio, and 60 years away from realizing that the New York Knicks are the bane of my existence. I'm sorry, they are. And born into this world are storyteller Andy Garcia, AOL founder David W. Brown, U.S. astronaut David M. Brown, tennis great Sue Barker, former Family Feud host and comedian Ray Combs, rest in peace, writer of L.A. Law, Chicago Hope, and Boston Legal, David E. Kelly, pro wrestling legend Diamond Dallas Page, NBA legend Michael Cooper, and my next guest. He was born in Biloxi, Mississippi, but grew up in Atlanta, GA. He began acting at age four and a half. A mute clown is what he would first play. He was cast in a locally produced TV show entitled The Little Pioneers. His range is vast and his drive limitless. His work produced a bevy of cheers. As a child, he grew up doing a lot of Shakespeare, something that truly speaks to me. Anyone with deep respect for the bard can truly unlock their spirit and watch it be set free. After graduating from Grady High School in 74, he went on to London where he started drama at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. He connected with the craft, the perfect fit, bullseye, like watching Spock playing darts. Speaking of his gift, legendary casting director Marion Doherty had the perfect view. 
He was a presence on stage, and soon, King of the Gypsies would mark his first feature film debut. He was nominated for the Globe and Globe Awards not once, not twice, but thrice. His incredible body of works include Raggedy Man, The Dark Knight, and Inherent Vice. The Pope of Greenwich Village, Best of the Best, and Runaway Train, in which he's an Oscar Academy Award nominee. With over 700 credits to his name, his vocation truly gives him glee. The man has been all around the world, from Mumbai to Shanghai, Austin to Boston, Aruba to Cuba, Angola to Pensacola, Arizona to Barcelona, Daytona to Verona, Alaska to Nebraska, Bombay to L.A., Sudan to Japan, Montreal to Nepal, Minnesota to North Dakota. He's a supporter of animal rights and is a black belt in Taekwondo. Are these rhymes done? Yet, nada, nope. Maybe he can beat me up if I ever consider investing in the New York Knicks again. One can only hope. I hope he enjoyed this intro and isn't scarred. Perhaps, hopefully, I've impressed the good old bard. Through discipline, passion, consistency, and joy, he's built his foundation brick by brick. So put your hands together for a warm, humble, talented human being. Last name Roberts, first name Eric. Eric Roberts, welcome to the green room, my friend. I was told that you gave great intros. Uh, so I'm waiting. And I'm just, I'm just, you know, when, when you have a man who is an occasion, it seems to me that you would, you would, you would scream and announce his, his, his presence in a very complimentary way as opposed to not. Sure. So I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Okay, How are you, Al? For you. There are not enough compliments for you, my friend. What a nice way to wake up. Thank you, dude. Wow. You deserve every bit of it, man. Are you kidding that me? That was a lot of fun, dude. Hey, let me start things off, man. I want to just say this off the bat, Eric. Look, we're living in wacky times, man. Your body of work has helped so many people because oh, you are man. one human being that cares so much about the craft and storytellers and independent filmmakers. You epitomize what the art is all about, man, from the heart. That is so kind of you. It it it, it like started out as something, then it became something else, and now it's become something else. So it's 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 really been fun the evolution of it all. And I have a boss who's my organizer, who is my sure. wife hyphen manager, sure. and um, and as she's in the brains you know, behind my operation, and I'm the operation, and uh, we just have fun every single day. I love it. I love it. I love it, man. Uh, you know, it's it's interesting because if we go back to the old DeLorean, as I bring up and go back in time, your father wakes you up to watch The Late Show when you're around eight years old. And, and you watched guys like Robert Dunay from Goodbye, Mr. Chips. And he said, man, that's real acting. That's what I want to do. Is that right? Yeah, I was I was actually six. I was in the first yeah. grade. And he woke me up for the 1130 movie, which is in you know, the middle of the night for me at six. And he says, I want you to see a movie. So I got up and I watched. I couldn't believe it was one person playing that man from 19 to 80. And um, and that was the first you know, seed of, uh, of playing other people. Sure. To the point where other people could believe I were those people. And uh, so. So, yeah, that's what that 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 was my first real seed was goodbye, Mr. Chips, Robert Donay. Oh, that, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, I I remember watching Gilligan's Island, and I say that because mm -hmm. years later, it was Richard Donner who was my mentor. He got me into the industry, and without him, I wouldn't be working for the studio I work for now. And I remember he was such a fan of his own work when he directed Gilligan's Island. I remember reading about that. So the first day I meet him, you know, people said Richard, you know, the longest hippie that's still directed in Hollywood. What a great guy. But um, he took me in, and before I met him, somebody told me, they were playing a rib on me, they said, you know, he really likes people imitating Gilligan for some reason. I'm like, all right, uh -huh. cool. So with my limited experience in storytelling, sure, let me, let me whip up a Gilligan costume. I meet him, and he goes, yeah, your agent, your agent Bob from ICM, he's, he, you're, you're Avi? Yeah, yeah, you're a fan of Gilligan, right? And he deadpans and he looks at me and he goes, yeah, but you're not Gilligan. So take that crap off your face and take that crap off your body. And then we could talk like two gentlemen. That's rough. <laughs> That's rough. But somehow a budding relationship began. So like, it's interesting how we look back at certain things that happened in our life early on. And then it's still something we can use. Uh, emotional recall, if you will. Now, your father, Walter Grady Roberts, ran a young people's acting school called the Actors and Writers Workshop in Atlanta, GA. Your mom taught a class for the five-year-olds. And memorizing dialogue, it, it helped you overcome stuttering because maybe at first it was it was a mechanical helper of sorts, but then you ended up loving the craft through that, right, Eric? Yeah, well, it was it was learning how to memorize that I realized I could I could be other people. 
I could, sure. I could have an English accent. I could have a Southern accent. I could, I could talk stupid, whatever it was, I could be somebody else. And so, uh, it became just a great escape for a little kid. And I had all kinds of imaginary friends. So I would, I would, I would rehearse all day with my imaginary friends, whatever I was doing. Sure. And, uh, they would give me notes <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, it was, it was a great imaginary life that, uh, that turned into a vocation. Man. Oh man. Uh, and your passion for it is never to me, at least from just hearing you speak about the craft. Sometimes I need to have that wake up, you know, that wake up call and to see what you do and how much you still do and give back is incredible. And let's go back. Speaking of giving back, Martin Luther King, who gave back a lot to his community and to us as Americans, you grew up with his kids. Yolanda Yoki King Jr. was one of the students that you befriended. And you also went to the same high school or part of the same student council. And as a young adult, there's something that I correct me if I'm wrong. When it comes to the stage, at least you're watching not the entire play, but you're watching John Gale Good, Ralph Richardson in a play called No Man's Land on Broadway. It moved you. And because it showed you what it's like to have the weight of dialogue and character when it's resting on one's shoulder, that left an impact on you, right, Eric? Well, it's a two-character play, okay. and, uh, and they talk their asses off the whole play. <laughs> and uh, it's very profound dialogue. It was by, it was by, it was by Pinter, so it's very wordy and very dense, sure. very profound. And, uh, and I only saw part of the play because they couldn't afford to buy a ticket. So I would, I would go in with the... With the, with the, with the um, with the with the intermission audience and i would watch act two every night so act two i got down very well and uh, <laughs> and i just i just i just realized what it was to hold an audience with just words and no no props no set just you as wow. a as an instrument i'm gonna hold the audience and i saw those guys do it both separately and as a pair and went wow this is yeah. this is acting <laughs> yeah it's do you do you subscribe to in my workshop that I teach my students? Do you subscribe to the before and after? Because a lot of people will talk about the before you're on stage and we all know about our characters and how they shouldn't be sitting in a dressing room. We have to get to know them. We have to know what their day to day is. Some people journal. Some people have other methods to be able to bring life to their day to day. What about the after? The after is as important. You're walking off stage. The after is as important as the before. Would you agree? Uh, yes, but it's easier. Uh, because it comes naturally. You don't have to search for it. You don't have to find it. It finds you. Sure. So, so it's easier when, when you're done that uh, feeling finds you and, and you, and you, and you sit with it. But bef before you start, you have to create what and why you are. Yes. Asking the wise too. And I, I love how on stage, you know, somebody said, what if I make a mistake? And I'm like, Hey man, rehearsals are where you can throw stuff on the wall and see if it works. And then the beautiful thing about, you know, exploring is you can make discoveries that way. That's where you can make discoveries. That's the beauty of it. I ask for rehearsals with everything I do. And when they, when they give me rehearsals in, uh, in, uh, in uh, movies, I thank them endlessly because it's yes. such a luxury and it's so much fun. And you get to know your other actors, actors for the most part are really cool people. Absolutely. Yeah. But it doesn't exist that much today, right? Rehearsals. It's not commonplace. No, and we have a new breed of filmmaker that uh, did not grow up on a set. He grew up on a computer. So, yes. so it's a whole new misunderstanding of the of the of the execution, and uh, because you have to deal with peeps who are older, younger, fatter, skinnier, crankier, happier, all kinds of differences from you, and you have to bring everybody together and make it work. Hard job. And it's even harder now because it's so much faster. You don't have time to get to know people. You're uh, you're thrown t together and you have to go and you have to go yesterday. So it, it's a it's it's hard, but it's Gosh fun. Almighty. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the the adventure is meeting people, I guess, the sense of ensemble. Man, that's what it's all about. And, you know, when I think of sense of ensemble, I think of projects that really emphasize that film projects in the seventies during uh, the maverick days of the seventies. And you know how a lot of the filmmakers had a lot of power from the studio system back then. And during this time, if we go back to January of 78. You just came back from a funeral in Georgia, Peter Moss, writer of Serpico also wrote King of Gypsies. You read the script written by Frank Pearson, who actually also would later work with your wife in animal house. And during the biggest snowstorm in New York city history, 
Oh, gee, that's when you have a screen test. You go. No, from the upper it was list. not Animal House. It was A Star Is Born. A Star Is Born. Okay. Yeah, that's when they worked together. Yeah. But it must have been like, um, I guess that really tests us as storytellers because, again, you're thinking about all these reasons to why not do something and the whys, those that can't, don't, those that will do. And here you are doing, you're going to the screen test, regardless of this snowstorm, you go from the Upper West Side to the screen test, and then they wake you up, the screen test shown to Dino De Laurentiis and Frank, and I believe it was it Frank that went to bat for you and said, that's who I want? That's what Frank Pearson did. He he showed he showed Dino and he said, Dino, this is the kid I want. And uh, Dino supposedly said, Well, of course, after he watched the screen test. <laughs> Who knows? Oh my gosh. Um, it's it's interesting because there are people in our lives that mean a lot to us, and when they get to see our body of work, it means a lot to us even more so because we get to share that experience with them somehow. And you know, you you felt perhaps maybe very singular after losing your dad. And you truly attack the role in King of Gypsies. Your, your first day of shooting in February of 78 or so, uh, you're nervous. You bike your way to the studio, but Dino De Laurentiis flips out because you're riding a motorcycle. And you were forbidden to ride it from that point on. But it was people like Shelly Winters who treated you with a lot of respect that really meant something to you during that time. Right, Eric? Shelly was was uh, kind of adopted me. She was, she was very good to me. Told sure. me all kinds of personal stories, like about her affair with Marlon Brando, and right. uh, and and was and was just just a wonderful person to me. Because to be honest with you, I was scared every single day, and I had all these all these seasoned you know, pros around me. Even even Brooke Shields was a seasoned pro, sure. and uh, I was scared to death every day. Brooke took very good care of me. She acted like the grown up, and uh, she was wonderful. Susan, the same thing. She was just incredible to me. And uh, the other person who went out of their way to be good to me was Sterling right. Hayden. And, uh, and he was just a prize. And I will never forget him as long as I live. I love that. I love that. And, you know, there you are, of course, in this huge breakout role and being surrounded by such not only credible storytellers, but as human beings, let me ask you this, because is that really the stuff when people talk about the stuff? It's the in-between. It's the in-between. It's it's getting to know the people you're working with and then realizing that through your art and love of the craft, you can cultivate awesome lifelong friendships sometimes. Well, my character in that movie is outside in the family. The sure. only one that he really makes a contact with is a baby sister and his grandfather. Everybody else is is arm's length. So I kept that as an actor because I didn't want to get too comfortable because if I got comfortable, I thought at the time I would get lazy. And uh, so we had those fears, but I was a young man and uh, I now know that's not an issue. But at the time I was so scared to undermine my craft that I had sure. to be very careful, you know, like all young actors. And uh, I, I um, yeah. It's, would you agree that, in all art forms, especially our craft, that it's required to drop the thinking sometimes that gets in the way of creating. Well, uh, reaction is the actor's gold. If, 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 if you have honest reactions, you're fine. And that's to sure. everything. Like, what time is it? <laughs> what time is it? Oh, my watch stopped. Whatever it is, you have fun with it, you know, but, uh, but you know, you, you know, um, uh, Everything is a moment that's to be thrown away, but it has to be a moment first before you throw it away. Is that what you enjoy about picking apart a script is the subtext? Because the, the joy of just discovering subtext while you're reading a script and cracking it open is, is awesome, I think. It's one of the duties we have as storytellers. Well, that's the, uh, the uh, first thing that you look for, you know, when you read it in the first time. Sure. And then the, uh, the second time you, uh, you, uh, you read it for, for your character, and then and then and then you read it to learn it. And uh, but 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 you have those phases. You don't read it to learn it first. You will read it to read it. And then and then you read it to why it. And then you read it to take it. You know. I got to tell you, man. Uh, the film, of course, that I know you've spoken about many a times, and of course, obviously, you should. Bob Fosse, one of the oh. great directors, Star Eighty. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Maybe the younger generation doesn't know that this is, of course, based on a true story. Uh, production begins about 18 months, I believe, after the incident occurred. 
Mm. And and Bob Bob Fosse and Hal Ashby, they were your artistic cinematic heroes in a way because you had auditioned for Star 80 five times. And I believe you, you had to walk around the rooms because Bob Fosse was under the impression that you couldn't walk due to an accident. Am I right, Eric? Uh, in, my, in my fifth audition for him, he said, wow, nice work. Do me a favor, young man. I said, yeah, what do you need? He said, yeah. walk around this room. Faster, faster, faster. Stop. Turn around. Walk the other way. Okay, thank you. I said, what was that all about? He said, I was told you were a cripple. <laughs> I said, no, I'm okay. He goes, yeah, you seem to be all right to me. And that was kind of long and short of the discussion. It was not a big deal. Bob Fosse as a director was direct. Am I right, Eric? No, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was the most specific, um, cool cat I ever spent time with. He was just, he was, he, he had answers for anything, even if you made it up because he was so prepared. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got to prep. Do you subscribe to that? You got to prep before you play. Well, yeah. And he was a master. He, he, uh, he wrote, he directed it, he produced it. And, uh, and you know, yeah, he was it. I heard he also knew a shot list from like top down. I mean, he knew every specific detail and regarding shot lists. I mean, some directors don't necessarily or aren't as involved, but he was involved with every aspect. I, I thought Frank Pearson would probably be the most you know, prepared young director I'd ever met after I worked with him. And then I got sure. with Bob Fosse and it's an overused and abused word. So it like means nothing, but he was a genius. And sure. once you work with a real genius, you know, two things. First of all, that you're not one of them. And <laughs> second of all, they're hard to find. I've only met two in my life and I've been looking. <laughs> sure. And, 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 and they're hard to find. They're so unusual. And when you meet them, you understand they're, they're unicorns. And uh, he was one of them. And uh, uh, he, he, uh, he gave me more and he got more out of me than anybody has ever before or since. Your reverence for him is something that I think speak so highly of your character as well. And again, it goes back to how much you give back. You're, you're not the kind of guy that likes to hear, I'm great, but you love reminding people how great they are. And that I could pick up off that real quick. Oh, don't get um, me wrong. I don't mind hearing I'm great. <laughs> <laughs> just, just please know, don't ever refer to the Knicks and use the word greatness in the same sentence. Not when I'm around, please. I just add, that's all I ask. I won't. I promise. Appreciate that. Um, but you have to find the characters that you portray. And you have to find a way to like the characters you portray because, I mean, let's be honest here. If you don't like them, I, I think that a lot of people sometimes look at the antagonist or the heavies that they're playing and they don't realize because if you don't like them, you end, end up playing at them. And I, I don't, I believe that you don't become a character. I tell my students this too, nor does the character become you. You get to know the character on such an intimate level and it allows you to understand them and allows you to understand their plight because they need you as a storyteller to help nurture them. Is that, does that speak to you, Eric? It's great, buddy. Yo, personal hygiene is a thing that I find in all my characters. Because if right. a person is clean or not clean or unclean or only clean in certain certain like places, doesn't doesn't brush your teeth, for instance, you know what 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 whatever sure. it is, that's a character thing, and there's a reason for that. There was an abandonment somewhere that had to do with cleanliness. Whatever it is, you know, you find it. And you and you blow it up and you and you make your personality out of whatever that is. Well, I find personal hygiene tells me everything about a person. So I find their personal hygiene and why. And uh, and then I, I can I can walk out of the house as them and and um, love my peeps while oh, I'm playing, God. while I'm playing them. Uh, I played some really bad peeps. So I have to find you know, things to, uh, to like about them and to be comfortable with them. And uh, sometimes it's hard, but it's always fun. But you gave a lot of humanity to these characters. I mean, even Paul Snyder. I mean, we're talking about a guy. I mean, obviously that the audience is watching, they're not rooting for a Paul Snyder, but then you gave so much humanity to him in those moments where he truly felt, and I could, I could catch the inner conflict and maybe this helps out the editors in post-production because you're giving them so much right? Whether it's A-roll, B-roll, and you're giving them a lot based on your reactions. And I could almost see Paul Snyder working things out in his mind and, and questioning himself as he's, as he's making these actions and these choices that he's making. And you could tell that he has such inner conflict in him while he's making these horrible choices. Well, if Paul hadn't, hadn't killed Dorothy 
he would have been a multimillionaire because he invented he 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 uh, he started the uh, the male strip club. What's it called? Chippendales. Chippendales. Right. Chippendales. He would have been very wealthy. He would have been fine for for, for the rest of his life. Had all the little you know, blonde girls he wanted around him, around him, and he would have sure. been fine. But jealousy is a, is a nasty beast, and uh, he overreacted and lost his life and hers. Took his life and hers, and um, not cool. But had he not done that, he was a great businessman and he had a great idea that was going to explode and make everybody rich. Without question. But, you know, Peter Bogdanovich was too handsome. <laughs> he got right, under his skin. Right. You know, it is what yeah. it is. It's awful. It's, and, you know, if anyone understands insecurity, it's storytellers. We, we get that. Yeah. Good for you, pal. It's Every day I deal with it, man. I mean, just, we deal with that stuff every single day. Yeah. Um, and we're speaking of doing so much to give your characters a unique, not just a unique look, a unique perspective on life, giving them their own style, giving them their own substance. You know, we'll talk about Pope of Greenwich Village because you did all of that. And of course, for all of your roles, but you're nominated for the Golden Globe Award in a category that wouldn't exist. Uh, I believe it was newcomer for King of Gypsies. Am I right? That was uh, the last year they uh, they gave that award and I lost it. <laughs> the last year they gave that award. Yeah. I mean, so at the time, are you telling yourself, look, of course you come from the stage, uh, you're doing really well across the board and film. Are you starting to tell yourself that, look, this is a career. Most storytellers, it's not about being rich and famous. It's saying I can do this for a living at this point. Do you start seeing yourself doing it more so than just a career? Because now you're, you're, you're exploding Eric at that point. It became so precious to me. It became my life. It became my whole focus. It became everything. Sure. And, uh, and uh, I ended up going back, 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 back to the stage, not uh, making another movie right away. I went back to the stage in a, in a, in a, in a play called Mass Appeal with Milo O'Shea. And then wow. uh, after that, I did Raggedy Man with, uh, with, with, with a Sissy Spacek, which is one of my favorite jobs ever because I played the uh, boy that I grew up with. And um, that's, who I played in that in that movie? His name is Irwin. Raggedy Man is an amazing film. Yeah, it's a, and Jack Jack Fisk is an amazing director. He's an art director by trade and by fame. That's right. Yeah, he's one, of, he's one of my favorite 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 directors I ever worked for, and that he's he's very in tune to the actor and the process, and he's just a lovely person. A lot of schools of thought. Are you in favor of the following school of thought of working with the director who says, okay, look, this is my take. Of course, you're prepared, so give me yours. And then the third, improvisation. I mean, having different choices, different takes that allow you to do it his way, your way, and then any way. Of course, if you're prepared, of course, to be able to do that. Well, I'm old school. And I come to set with the understanding of we have a script because we all agree on something. We all agree okay. on on this we all agree on these printed pages we all have an agreement that's what we're going to do okay so we're all on the same page so i'm making the same movie in the same way that's how i like to go to work and after you get it done if you have brilliant people and a brilliant director and a brilliant dp and your co-star is brilliant you say okay one one for the gipper just have fun same same, same thing yeah improv or not change the energy have fun go action that's always fun but the uh, the movie comes first, not my fun. Not do we have time to do this? You know, it, it, if we have time, great. But let's make the movie. Let's sure. not stroke each other and have these great ideas on set. Let's do all that sure. before we get to set. So we shoot the movie on set. We don't talk about the movie on set. We do it. Absolutely. And that's how I like working best. I don't like showing up and talking about it. I like showing up and doing it. You're going to talk about it. Let's talk about it, either on the phone or in person, in rehearsal, whatever it is. But le let's not start at A on set. Let's start at M or L or P on set. Let's let's be halfway through the alphabet, you know, so we know what we're doing. That's 100%. how I like going to work. That's how Bill Paxton was. I've worked with Bill for a few years, and I wrote with what him. What a lovely man. How lovely was he? So yeah. incredible as a human being. And working with him was a joy. And by the way, Charlie... Uh, Charlie asked a question. Charlie wants to ask Eric, Erica, did you ever work with Bill Paxton? That's from one of our viewers who sent in a, a message earlier for you. Uh, Bill and I hung out together so much that I don't, I don't remember specifically what the movie was, but we were in a 
couple of three movies at the same time, but not on the same scene. Sure. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. And, and Charlie asked another question. Uh, difference between soliloquy and monologue. You are in your own world in a soliloquy. Think of Hamlet. Think of the famous soliloquies. You are. You could be in your underwear <laughs> wondering what the meaning of life is because no one is there and you're speaking out loud and you're articulating and projecting. In a monologue, it's with a scene partner to the audience. But that's a great question, Charlie. Thank you again for keeping this thing. Guys, seven figure views across the board because of you on 53 platforms combined, seven figures. We started with a big old donut, but thanks to you guys and gals and pals, here we are. Now, guys, I promised you Pope of Greenwich Village. I got to do it. I love it. I love this film so much. You read the book. You mentioned the fact that you wanted to play Polly. And no, gotcha. Uh, Chimino was, they talked about him re re replacing the uh, director who we lost. And we, we talked about him replacing him. But um, we were nervous because of, uh, what's it called? Heaven's Gate? Yes, what 1980. Yeah, Heaven's Gate. Sure. We were nervous because of that movie, so we, me, me and Mickey said no. We don't want to work with him on this because of Heaven's Gate. You almost tanked the studio, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. No, he did. He did tank United Artists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. And so you're speaking to Mickey Rourke. You guys, you guys have a conversation uh, with uh, Cock and Kirkwood, and, and he comes Stuart Rosenberg. And Stuart was gentle, specific. He'd speak to the character. He'd give you guys freedom to explore. Which in turn, of course, leads to discoveries, and that resonated with you, right, Eric? He was such a lovely man, and he understood actors, and he understood the uh, process, and he understood that uh, me and me and me and me and uh, Mickey were ready to go, and uh, yeah. and uh, and he allowed it. Okay, let's go, guys. And uh, he he would he would back us up every day. We uh, we'd make choices. He's I like choice A, choice C, choice D, not B, not F. Don't do those. Okay, go go again. Take two. Let's go. <laughs> And uh, that's that's what he was like. And he was cool. He was fun. And he was kind. Oh, gosh. It makes all the difference in the world. Doesn't gosh. it? Yeah. I mean, we're thinking about guys and gals of some of these iconic films. And, of course, speaking of iconic, Runaway Train. Uh, oh. Man, what, what a film. I cannot wait to delve into this because Eddie Bunker wrote the screenplay. And, and he used to talk through the vents in the isolation cells with inmates on death row when, when he was doing time. But that's when he met interesting people that you wouldn't think would inspire him. He, he met serial rapist and kidnapper Carol Chessman, who became a writer, and he inspired Bunker to yeah. try writing also. True and it story. turned out that Danny Trejo himself was picked as someone who'd help you box, uh, thanks to Eddie Bunker. Uh, but Danny was quite emotional, right, when he was selected to... Uh, well, that that's a, that's, a, that's a lovely story. Uh, Eddie Bunker said he he runs through all these people. Eric, Eric, you're gonna you're gonna pick the guy you're gonna box with today. Yeah, right. Yeah, I'll I want to pick a friend of mine. Okay, he's a Mexican. He's got tattoos. Okay, no sweat. I'll pick him. Okay, cool. <laughs> Line them all up. They're all Mexican. They all have tattoos. I say, sure. hold the page. I go find Eddie. It takes like 15, 20 minutes. I find Eddie. Thank God I found you, man. I got to pick that guy, and they're all Mexican, and they all have tattoos. I don't right. know. Right. He goes okay. He's got this man on his chest, a boy on his chest, a whole person with a sombrero. <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> I go, okay, I go back. And there, sure enough, is a person on a man's chest in a sombrero. So I say, I want that guy right there. And he started crying. He was so happy and so moved. And um, he was a welterweight champ at San Quentin. And he's crying oh, wow. because I picked him to box. And um, he was just... I, I, I was good to him. He was good to me. And we're lifelong friends. We see each other probably twice a month, have ever since. Sure. And we just love each other. And he's so and, grateful, uh, man, to you. He saw how you were able to treat him and take him in. And Well, oh, man, from that day to this day, it's all been because of Danny Trejo, not Eric Roberts. Oh, gosh. But, you know, no, he's special, Trejo. dude. He's a special yeah. guy. There's, there's so many guys and gals and pals uh, out there that uh, just love this craft for different reasons. And I like the fact that you speak to people on a human level. That's what's so missing. You know, people talk old school and old Hollywood. I call it the right school. It's not the old school. It's the, to me, it's the right school. I mean, it's the only school for me. That's but uh, sweet of you, dude. Thank you. 100%, man. It's wholehearted. You know, and, and Runaway Train, it's a reminder to me when I watched the film. And I wanted to, when I did research for this, of course, I watched it again. I've seen it many a times, but... I want to try to capture the essence of this verbally. And when I watch Runaway Train, it's a reminder that the great adventures are great because they happen to people we care about. 
That was true of the African Queen. That was true of Stagecoach. That was true of Seven Samurai. Three movies that would otherwise seem to have little in common. But it's also true of this tale, Runaway Train. The two desperate convicts on a train, which of course we know is hurtling through the snows of Alaska. Your character in Runaway Train is a wild man. And prison life has made him dangerous. He acts without regard for consequences. And when these two men are joined by a woman, it's not just a plot gimmick. Her role as an outsider gives them an audience and a mirror. Would you concur, Eric? Yeah, well, that's why she's there. And that's also why it's a girl and not a guy. And, <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, it was it was a very thankless role that they that, that, that they gave Rebecca. It was not well written. Eddie Bunker sure. did not write good women. He wrote good men. And sure. he wrote great men. But um, so it was kind of a thankless part for her. But she was a lovely girl, and uh, and uh, she suffered right along with us in the, in in Alaska. <laughs> my gosh, my gosh, what a production! Of course, working with the great John Voight as well. I mean, guys, oh, guys I, I guess yeah. about John Voight. So John Voight weighed only about thirty pounds more than I weighed, and I only weighed about a hundred. I was I was a welterweight, so I weighed like a hundred and like thirty five, and John oh, wow. one hundred and sixty. But he has on a bodysuit, so he looks like he weighs 250. He oh, does I see. not. He's a bean pole, but he's got that bodysuit. That bodysuit makes him look huge. Especially yeah, I wouldn't have believed it. Wow. I know, dude. This is one, one, one of America's greatest actors. And uh, 100%. And, 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 and I mean, did you see Coming Home? I mean, and, oh my and, gosh. And, and, and the list goes on, dude. Body I mean, this guy is a phenomenal actor. And Without I got question. to work with him on a phenomenal, uh, two phenomenal characters. And uh, we had so much fun together. And we and killed I, it. And we suffered. And, think, and the state, but the stakes of each scene, I thought there were so much, there were so many stakes when you're watching this. And I think that's maybe not something people articulate, but like there are so many stakes in this film. And that you see these characters going through and they're being tested constantly. And I know that as a storyteller, Eric, that's the type of work that speaks to you. Well, every scene is about overcoming a desperate moment because every moment is desperate. Every moment is we got to get out of this moment into the next. Let's go. And every moment is like that in that movie. Conflict, Even, yeah. I need some shoes. I need some shoes. It's it's serious stuff to need shoes in the snow, dude. That's that's a need. And uh, <laughs> absolutely. And, and uh, so you know, just everything about it is desperate. Everything. And uh, even even the end, the uh, the effect that I live is is desperate. It's a desperate feeling. It's yes. Like, oh my God. And uh, and yeah, it's just it's it's an amazing film. Andre Kanchalasi put together an incredible, incredible movie. What a film, guys and gals! Please, yeah. uh, and of course, being nominated for an Academy Award for this film, incredible work and your body that of work. Mind. I will never get over that. I will never. Not a day goes by when sure. it probably doesn't pop in my brain like that was so cool. And and that's a fact. Yeah, the overall experience I can imagine. And, and continuing to play such different characters and different roles. And you know, when it comes to again, we talked about ensemble, we talked about rehearsals, but the communication with your fellow colleagues in a linear fashion, especially when we're doing theater, we're doing stage, it's it's much more of a linear fashion because you have to connect with them. Uh, it's all about opening up and experiencing different perspectives. Sometimes it may be perspectives that we haven't contemplated. So in other words, when it comes to the stage, it helps us understand what it's like to be human. Would you agree? Well, when it's on the stage, you, you can you, you, you can actually feel the energy from the actual person on the stage if you're sure. in it, if they're in it. If you're both in it, you can actually feel the energy. You can't really do that in a movie. You, 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 can, you can you go with it. And you can enjoy it. It can make you cry. It can make you laugh. But um, to be in a theater, to be 100 feet from somebody who is dying and they're making you feel their pain, it's it's personal. It's intimate. And it is sincere. And uh, when that happens, that's, that's why the audience thinks, oh, they discovered genius because they were moved. And it's the most expensive thing in the world is emotional movement. I love that. I love that. Have you had moments sometimes where, you know, nicely you pulled aside a fellow colleague of yours and said, hey, man, you weren't present. Where are you, man? I, I need you. I, I need you here. Uh, only once yeah, in 700 some odd appearances, only once. And it was in a knife fight I had in a movie. And I told the actor, I need you right here 
he was a drinker. I said, I need you right here because it's very dangerous what we're doing. Okay. Sure. I need you right here. And he said, okay. And he did it for me. He was very yeah, cool about it. Amazing, man. But, but, uh, but that's the only time I've ever spoken to anybody like, like I was aware that they had a problem. I know, I know the following sounds super sappy, but I'd rather be sappy than cynical. That's my motto. But uh, I feel as if as storytellers, we want to entertain and provoke. We want to reconnect with the simplicity that should never leave the core of what we do, which is curiosity. It's the why we do what we do and why we treat each other the way that we do. The comfort we get from a shared uncertainty, that's the bond. Is that how you feel about the arts as well? Well, uh that's kind of too dressed up. I just, I just, I just, I just love them like I love my family and they belong to me like my family does. It's a very intimate relationship. And, and I just, I just love my vocation. Like I love my family. I love that, man. Yeah. yeah it's I, I, sometimes you go into the great unknown and yeah. you don't know where the hell you're going. Uh, I'm a big motorcycle rider. And like, you know, some, a lot of my ex-girlfriends about seven at last count, would all say the same thing. Hey, where are you? When are you coming home? Where are you going? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't it bother you, Avi? No, it doesn't. How come it doesn't bother you not knowing where you're going? Because I know where I am already in life. They don't understand motorcycles, Avi. They don't understand motorcycles. Uh, I don't do Harleys. I got a Viper. But like, no, nah, man, it's just exploring. It's going out there and figuring out that there are like-minded people that really want to traverse high and low. And they want to be able to find something that speaks to them. And when they do... Knowing that they found, like you said, somebody else that's like-minded, it's like it really is the gift that keeps on giving when you know that there are others that share the same enthusiasm as you do. And You're it's beautiful. So right, and it's, dude. it's amazing. That's that's it. That's the it factor right there. I'm not saying it's all it's all you know, sunshines and roses. I'm not saying that. But but knowing that you found something you love, that's the gift. That's the gift. Yeah, and it keeps on giving. Oh, man. Uh, if I could go back in time, uh Joseph Chaikin, La Mama Theater. Uh, growing up in Queens, New York, it, it would have been amazing to be able to work during the experimental theater days. Oh, I brought wow. up Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Some of the giants, man. And I brought up Donner earlier for our viewers. Of course, guys and gals, director of Superman, Goonies, Lethal Weapon, so, so many more. As a mentor, I wouldn't have worked in the studio system for two decades if it weren't for his tutelage. And all these years later, as a screenwriter, host, teacher of the craft, I again, I tell my students, we talked about the before, we talked about the after. But how liberating is it, Eric, to take a thought, a singular thought that you have when you're on stage, when you're on set, when you've done the work, you've done the prep, you've done everything that you've been asked of and more. How liberating is it to take a thought and manifest that thought into an artistic expression? Just a thought. Well, when that happens the most is in scenes that are a whole story in the scene or a monologue it's a whole story within the monologue and you can go from a to z and whatever the a to z is be it happiness be it sadness be it loss be it gain whatever it is you can go the whole journey for the audience and you and you can show them the human element here is human and you can show them and it's so much fun to get their reactions i love watching i love watching people watch my lose my thumb scene in pope because, well, because, because they must come up to you a lot thing. right and say that they probably come oh. up to you a ton and do that whole thing right oh yeah so much fun are you kidding and it's been i don't know 35 years and i yeah. still enjoy the hell out of it when they come to me in airports and go charlie <laughs> i love them for that it's it's the choices man that you've made and i think that's why anybody anything that you've done and that's a lot of people may do their work and they say, OK, I'm going to give back. But again, your way of giving back is saying, look, I'm going to work. I love my vocation. And in turn, of course, you know, there's also a, a, a really another way of looking at it, a different perspective is you never know which director is going to blow up. You never know which director, which young filmmaker is going to actually be successful. But the sheer fact that you've been able to help films receive financing, lending your name to a project. My friend, that's selfless, man. That is totally selfless. Uh, come on, I I love I love I love I love young filmmakers. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, they're and they're 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 also the most fun, and they also, you know, they don't they don't light films anymore, and they certainly don't light actors like taking you know, care of their faces. They don't. They that no. does not happen anymore. It, you're no. you're just on there, and and the 
cameras are way too low and you're not lit and you're not attractive and you're just acting your ass off. It's just, that's our world and welcome to it. And, um, and uh, I've also noticed that young filmmakers can go either way. I asked once, I said, can we have the camera up on my face? And the young filmmaker got so insulted, he put the camera on the floor and kind of you know, demanded me to have a problem with it. I said, no, I'm oh. it. Oh, Yeah, I know. So you never know what you're going to get. And it's all in the presentation. It's all in how I ask, can I have the camera a little higher? So we're not here while I'm talking. And, um, and if they say no, and they have a reason, I say, yeah, but here's what pisses me off. No, what? what pisses me off is lack of etiquette is the fact that someone can't treat an elder with respect who's been in this craft and industry way longer. I mean, you've been doing so much work. I could say that you were putting out hit after hit after hit while I was popping pimples trying to look good for my high school prom. And here yeah. I am going to talk back to someone who has a vast array of experience and wants to make this a better product. But the here's, respect why, here's why that's okay. Every movie is not just another movie. It is somebody's baby. It is somebody's infant who has to have his diaper changed and has to be fed. It is, a, it, it is an infant that needs care. And, and it belongs to somebody on the set. Probably your director, probably your producer, probably both. And it's not a game. That's yeah, but so does whole... your character, though. Your character needs nurturing from you, too. I understand what you're saying. And that's my responsibility as the actor. Right. Their responsibility is the movie. And so you have to respect that. And I do. And, and look, you're not going to be told great things about yourself every day, all day of your life. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And yeah, you you've got to... a good attitude about it. You do, man. But I mean, I wish, I wish there were people that, because the story you told, it sounded like that, that what he did in that moment was to me disrespectful. I'm not saying that we don't have moments where we're in a fit of rage. I get that. But again, I think I, I grew up in a way where I learned more by, believe it or not, I learned more by keeping my mouth shut, my ears open. That's what my dad taught me. And I take that with me all the time. You learn well, that's more. That's why we got two years. That's only happened once. And uh, and most people are great about it. Or they or they tell me this isn't your movie, Mr. Roberts. I say you're totally right. Excuse me. <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> I, I can I can be told to shut up and uh, and am fine with it. <laughs> I don't have any issues. Well, I gotta tell you, my friend, I, I had a really cool time before we wrap things up. Maybe we'll play a fun game. Uh, we always play fun games to wrap up every one of these awesome segments with some of the awesome luminaries guys you can check out the new network.com it's www.thenewnetwork.com that is www.thekanetwnetwrk.com who knew we knew and so do you guys and gals subscribe three different tiers uh co-hosts across the board thankfully these are amazing individuals that i co-host shows with 62 per month guys and gals 62 shows drop every single month uh guys like rick barry of course we've worked with people like john goodman and tony banderas guys there are 60 shows a month that you can catch on this network right now by subscribing to one of three tears but is john said, goodman one of the coolest cats who ever breathed amazing human being the I way he treats crew man. members every oh my god what, what a, a gentleman cool cat he and I had so much fun on Righteous Gemstones together. We had so much fun. He was teased as a kid, and comic books were there for him. He always talks about, he doesn't mention that publicly a lot, but you know, comic books kind of gave him a big escape. And I remember watching him once talking to a director, and they were arguing about film stock, you know, 35 millimeter, of course, cheaper to shoot in Vancouver and Canada. And they're talking about all these different ways if they can get this scene done. Uh, I think they were looking at dailies, and then a crew member was struggling. And John walked past. It was like, I think it was might even been the second unit director. I don't know who he was talking to. But he walks over. He helps the gentleman who's struggling with lifting a crane or something. And they're like, hey, man, we got people for that. And John's like, not necessary. I, I can help. And I've seen him do that two or three different times where he was there for crew members when, you know, you wouldn't expect that sort of a thing. So a great human being. You're right. Well, also, the, uh, the coolest people on the planet are movie crews. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Movie crews for sure, guys. And, you know, again, you know, when we think about the overall experience, unsung heroes, they are the unsung heroes of a set. And they're the same worldwide. They're always the same. They're always the coolest. Well, ask you two philosophical questions before we have some fun and get out of here, my friend. Uh, question number one, in your opinion, can someone be happy when faced with suffering? Can someone be happy with, when faced with suffering? Uh I, I, I think you have to define what kind of happiness you're after because it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be happiness with a cloud at the very least. Makes sense. Do you think morality is relative or absolute? 
morality has to be relative because times change. Love that. Guys and gals, let's have some fun as we soon will be bidding uh, Mr. Eric Roberts adieu and thanking him for his great time as well. Uh, we got a game here called I Would Pay. I'll offer you up a trio of options, <laughs> and you let me know, of Good course, time. they're wacky. You let me know which one you'd pay for and why. Of course, these are all wacky and they're supposed to be. So, Mr. Eric Roberts, are you ready to play I Pay? I'm ready to play I Pay. Let's do it. Guys and gals, Mr. Eric Roberts, you can play along as well. Eric Roberts, please, my friend, choose which one you'd pay for and why of the following. Would you pay to see Rocky Balboa as a neurosurgeon, Seinfeld as a correctional officer, or Rambo the talk show host? Seinfeld. The correctional officer. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to see him 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 uh, deal with criminals. <laughs> how how would he though? How would he deal yeah. with criminals? <laughs> It'd be funny. I want to see funny. that. It'd be funny. <laughs> oh man, uh, Rambo, of course. You know, I brought this up with Rambo. It's so interesting that they didn't the, the original in the novel, Rambo actually gets killed. It's a mercy kill. Yeah, it and, does. and Stallone had the foresight. You've worked with Stallone, of course. He had the foresight. What a genius to say, look, this is a franchise. They were supposed to kill him at the end. Yeah. Colonel Troutman's character, of course, uh, or the character of Troutman. And then he's one of my favorite bosses I've ever had. And I've worked with him twice. Once, yeah, just a star, and then as a star director. One of the coolest cats you've ever been on a set with. And he's funny, he's smart, he's always early. I like him. I love that. I love yeah. that. Continuing on with I'd pay guys and gals, Mr. Eric Roberts, of the following trio of options, who would you select for and why? Why would you pay for that to watch? Hannibal Lecter as a regular cast member of 90210, Big Bird the Bounty Hunter, or Conan the Librarian? Uh, the first one. Hannibal Lecter is a regular cast member of 90210. Yeah. <laughs> I want to I wanna, I wanna see him be a kid. <laughs> I see that dramatic turn in, in the opening credits. You see that, Burke? I see the dramatic turn in the opening I'm sorry, credits. I'm where sorry, I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> That's just too funny. <laughs> also, Big Bird the Bounty Hunter makes me laugh too. Just I can see. Oh that well, you know what? You know what? He ran the streets of Sesame, man. Yeah. Boo. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> couple, couple of more from Mr. Eric Roberts, guys and gals. Which would you pay for to see and why, Eric Roberts? Would you pay to see Darth Vader as a wedding planner, Godzilla as a massage therapist, or Freddy Krueger as a personal trainer? Freddy Krueger as a personal trainer. Oh man, yes. Thank you. Like my problems went away when you said that. Like, <laughs> we need to see that, is what I'm saying. Yeah, but we haven't seen it. Why would he make a good personal trainer? Because he would he would work you till you bled. <laughs> oh wow <laughs> guys and gals a couple of more and we are out of here uh mr eric roberts which would you pay for to see and why of the following options alf attorney at law papa smurf the hip-hop artist or mr bean the motivational speaker mr bean the motivational speaker i Me love too. that man i love that character you too uh roan atkinson what a genius oh, dude. Absolutely. <laughs> wow man i could watch him all day uh, last two options, guys and gals, for Mr. Eric Roberts and why we're playing. I'd pay and you can as well, guys and gals and pals. Let's go on to option number five right now. Which would you pay for the following trio of options and why, Mr. Eric Roberts? Would you pay to watch Beetlejuice as a runway model, cast of Goodfellas as studio audience members on Jerry Springer, or Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th as a professional ice skater? Cast of Goodfellas. As studio audience members on Springer. Yeah, boy, that's fun. Because <laughs> they'd be nasty. Oh, perfect fit. And guys, we're going to finish things off with, with classics. We're talking about incredible characters uh, that I grew up watching, of course. Last trio of options for Mr. Eric Roberts, and he would let us know which he will pay for of the following and why. Archie Bunker is a mountain climber, Ralph Cramden is a yoga instructor, or Don Corleone is a computer repair person. Oh, God, it's so close between A and B. Uh, <laughs> that's so close. That is so close. I think I got to go with A. Hey, Archie Bunker's a mountain climber. Yeah, I think so. Cause it's gonna it's gonna be fun to watch him fall. Would he still be mad at Edith as he's climbing? Uh, it's always Edith's fault. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, guys. I'd pay with Mr. Eric Roberts. Uh, I want to close things out, but before I do, you've done a million of these, man. You had a nice time. Was up there for you? This is a pleasure. Thank you. Oh man, you you're a pleasure, man. You really are. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're so honest and, and truthful. And I love that. Um, I want to give you a solo layout to close out any way you'd like any message for our fans, for our viewers, anything you'd like to say, uh, but guys and gals, remember they were once called motion pictures. <laughs> Don't let's never hyper-focus on the negative in life, guys have faith in what the world doesn't see for you yet. Learn more about yourself and express truth 
the lens may be grainy at first, but there's no sweet without the sweat. Self-awareness, guys and gals, can be progressive. And remember, it's not such a bad thing to have been something that you aren't today. Go get it. Mr. Eric Roberts, please close out the show any way you'd like. The pleasure was all mine. Years ago, when I was offered my first time to speak to a great big group about acting, I told my wife, I'm nervous. She, she, she said, all you have to do is be you and be kind because they're both valuable. <laughs> my wifey.